Okay, so we recently did a video about this poem, and I can't remember, was it Kamara who read the poem? Would you, do you mind reading it, performing it, and then we'll talk about it? Sure. I saw Emmett Till this week at the grocery store, looking over the plums one by one, lifting each to his eyes and turning it slowly, a little earth, checking the smooth skin for pockmarks and rot or signs of unkind days or people, then sliding them gently into the plastic, whist whistling softly, reaching with a slim woolen arm into the cart. He first balanced them over the wire before realizing the danger of bruising and lifting them back out, cradling them in the crook of his elbow until something harder could take that bottom space. I knew him from his hat, one of those fine pork pie numbers they used to sell on Roosevelt Road. It had lost its feather, but he had carefully folded a dollar bill and slid it between the ribbon and the felt, and it stood at attention. He wore his money, upright and strong. He was all ready to the checkout by the time I caught up with him. I called out his name, and he spun like a dancer, candy bar in hand, looked at me quizzically for a moment before remembering my face. He smiled. Well, hello, young lady. Hello, so chilly today. Should have worn my warm coat like you. Yes, so cool for August in Chicago. How are things going for you? Oh. He sighed and put the candy on the belt. It goes, it goes. So I, want, I think we should start with um, uh, talking a little bit about how this responds to a supermarket in California, the, uh, the Ginsburg poem. It's, it's clearly going off of that. Lily, do you have a thought about how that works? Well, I'd be happy to defer my thinking since everyone can see a lot of it in the new video. <laughs> Well, we have, but the video is not ready yet. And oh, sorry, that's true. Okay. Just, for the, just for the sake of this conversation. Okay. Where, sure. How did? What does it have to do with the the uh, supermarket in California by Allen Ginsberg? Sure. Well, so um, a couple of references that make help us make the connection. First line. Um, well, conceptually, seeing a a figure from the past in your contemporary supermarket as the speaker in the Ewing poem is seeing Emmett Till. Um, maybe the speaker in the Ginsburg poem is seeing Walt Whitman. Um, so that's a parallel. And then the first line, Emmett Till is looking over plums and there's like a lot of plum talk in the poem. So that's a little like, well, I guess it's a Williams connection actually. Sorry, I'm a little okay. yeah. scrambled. Um, <laughs> but so, um, Anyway, the but, idea but, but the Emmett Till figure is this person that's encountered in the supermarket is is looking closely at the produce, which is what's happening in the Yes, in the thank kitchen. you. Yeah. And so um and also the position of like the speaker standing apart and observing the figure for a moment before interacting and approaching, um, similar to in story. Mm -hmm. Um who wants to talk about well, maybe I'll invite Erica to do this and then we can go from there. Um Obviously, this isn't Walt Whitman. It's Emmett Till. What a big difference. Can we say the obvious? What are some of the big differences? <laughs> um, you know, well, this, I, you know, this is a poem that's imagining and otherwise. So, you know, Emmett Till was murdered, um, which is, you know, his... I'm not sure how to phrase this, but I, you know, I think that it's really important what E. Ewing is doing by choosing to focus the poem on Emmett Till. It changes the entire scope of reference for what the poem is doing and how the poem is working because it's an imagined situation where Emmett Till is able to exist in a way that he can't. Yeah. I would like to ask uh, Davy, Ambrose, and Kate, each speaking briefly, please, the, the, some version of, an answer to some version of this question, which is, 
uh, if it's picking up on Ginsburg's supermarket in California, at least for a start as a gambit, as a structure, we've got Ginsburg is actually in that poem and Ginsburg encounters Whitman and then Ginsburg gets to think about his own situation and the situation of 1955 as opposed to 1855. Um, and so in a way, it's either E. Ewing or the speaker, it's either Ginsburg or the speaker, but let's say it's E. Ewing and E. Ewing is saying, I was in a supermarket and I encountered Emmett Till who had not been killed and grew to an older age and was a very gentlemanly person and I encountered this person. So if, if Ginsburg walks away from the supermarket and back into his life, um, Eve Ewing also walks away from the encounter and walks back into her life. And I guess, so the question is, what is the, how does that parallel work and what's gonna be different? And how does Eve Ewing, what happens when she walks away or the speaker, what happens when she walks away? What's next? What goes on? I think in Ginsburg, and Davy, we'll start with you since you've really thought about the Ginsburg poem, it's not clear exactly what happens to, get to the Ginsburg figure when he walks away, but he's certainly lonely and would like companionship. And then there's this whole stuff about crossing the river of hell. So any thoughts, Davy, Ambrose, and then Kate on what the speaker is going to do next? Davey? I don't quite know that I can answer the question what the speaker is going to do next, um, but um, something that I can speak to is a, a major difference in these poems for me, and this is something that um, I, meant, I say as much in the video, is that um, the Ginsburg is imagining a um, non-realistic, um, like the moment of seeing Whitman in the grocery store is a moment that could not have been in Walt Whitman's life. It was, Whitman would have been in, you know, well over a hundred. And like the big difference for me in this poem is that um, seen in the grocery store, like this year, Emmett Till would have been in his late seventies. And that is the big difference in this poem is that one is imagining the um, continuation of a quotidian life were Emmett Till not, um, murdered by an act of racial violence in a way that um, a supermarket in California is imagining a hypothetical that is not about uh, if Walt Whitman had been given his full life, which he was, uh, but is imagining Ginsburg needing something. And this is not a poem that is about, this is a poem that is imagining kinship for totally different reasons. Mm. That's really, that's really good. And, and Dave Poplar points out that the poem was the Dick Ginsburg poem was written in the year that Emmett Till was murdered. Um, and so there's clearly some kind of connection there. Amber Rose Johnson, your thought about this? Yeah, I, I really love Davy's comments. And I'm thinking about <clears throat> another major difference between the poems. Um, and this is also kind of building on something that Gabe said in the chat, which is about desire and recognition. But at the end, Ginsburg is asking, is appealing to Whitman, is asking a bunch of questions, is looking for guidance. And there's something very different that happens in Eve Ewing's poem, which is that she calls to Emmett Till by name and he responds, um, not just to her as a stranger, but she start, but there's a moment of him being startled and then there's a moment of recognition. And what they talk about is something very mundane, um, which is different than sort of looking for guidance or looking for direction. It seems like the speaker in the Ginsburg poem um, is, yeah, is looking for guidance in a way that the speaker in Eve Ewing's poem is looking for just recognition and recognition, um, I, I guess, so there's a commentary about what it would mean to have um, Black elders that are able to recognize you, which is a question of what it would mean for Black life to not be under um, warfare. <laughs> And to, and to have an elder who's thinking about, you know, being warm against the cold, essentially, you know, the, the sweet, generous patriarchy um, of that community. Sweet, generous patriarchy. Well, that is, that is an oxymoron, but a sweeter version of what might be, you know, Emmett Till right. in his late seventies, worrying about how cold it's gonna be in Chicago. The Emmett Till who made it back home to Chicago to be able to endure the cold winters. Um, Kate, what's your thought about this? 
Um, I've been thinking a lot about why she's referring back to the two earlier poems and how Ginsburg borrows um, and well works in Whitman's sort of long lined ecstatic inclusive mode um, in his own sort of bebop way. Um, and the Ewing poem, she, I mean, the, the point of referring back to those poems might be the contrast in, in form here. Her lines are shorter. It, the, the mode is not ecstatic. It's very kind of quiet and um, not plotting, but sort of carefully moving forward. Um, so I think she's sort of speaking to the, the arrogance and the privilege of Ginsburg and Whitman and their ability to sort of speak in that mode. Um, so it's a critique of the Ginsburg. Yeah, I mean, I would say Whitman in particular sort of indicated that he was speaking for everybody. He was representing everybody. Mm. Um, and Ginsburg picked that up. And, you know, in poems like Howl, like Howl in particular, he tries to sort of kind of refer to everybody and, you know, embrace them all, um, include them all. And here we have one man um, from, you know, a historically excluded group. So I think the contrast in modes here is really the crux of the poem in a lot of ways. Yeah. I, I want to turn really briefly to Gabe and Ambrose to add one more thing to this. Um, uh, Gabe, um, the in Money, Mississippi, the encounter that led to the racist murder uh, was in a, a, a little store, five and dime, really. Um, and the and the Emmett Till who was in that store, by all counts, was pretty much as kind and polite as the Emmett Till who lives to be in his late seventies, in a Chicago store. Um, and so there's that contrast is in there. Uh, anybody who knows the Emmett Till story is reading this poem understands that this is the same Emmett Till. Um, but anyway, you 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 wanted to say something about the the importance of setting of using the Ginsburg with the setting of the market, yeah? Well, what I wanted to say really was like, one of the most important contrasts here is that for Ginsburg, I mean, Ginsburg's imagining like a kind of kin relationship with Whitman, with Lorca, with others through through sex. Like that was his, his theory was that he could connect to Whitman because he slept with somebody who slept with somebody who slept with somebody who's all the way to Whitman. And so Whitman in this poem is like, you know, he's like a flirtatious kind of old man. He's kind of doing his thing. He's like, and he kind of owns the grocery store space. Like he's really right. kind of spread out and doing his thing. And and Ginsburg has an, an admiration for it and, a, and an attraction to it. And, and I think Whitman in that poem's, Whitman's desire in that poem is a bit of a teaching kind of desire. So Ginsburg is learning his desires through that. The, the situation is very different in the Ewing. And I'm kind of curious about what, how Ewing, like, well, Ewing speaker and Till as a character in that poem, how their desires sort of intersect. Um, I think like uh, Davy used the phrase, the desire to be neighbors, that's like part of it. I mean, I think what Till's character says at the end of that poem is very much the kind of thing that maybe he said um, that incited an attack on him. So. So Till was murdered for a supposed, and, and later the woman confessed that it was not true, but um, a supposed speech act towards a white woman in her family grocery store um, and, and was killed for that kind of cross-racial speaking, um, which was understood as flirting. But I think like uh, the, the Till character who speaks to Eve Ewings and his sort of like, hello, how are, we, how are you doing? Like kind of small talk it's so charged in a different way here because of the history. And the, that kind of speech act of introduction or small talk like now means something a little different. Now it means convening in history. Now it means convening in the, po in the poem. It's an act that is like, I think taken in a way that's both melancholic and welcoming. 
Um, whereas in the historical story of Emmett Till, it, it, it's the sort of incitation to the violence committed against him. So it's just this big distinction, but it's just a funny thing to me that, that supermarkets are the like desire space in both of these poems. I think that's just something to think about for that historical moment of the 1950s. That's Good. Thank you for that context. Ambrose, did you want to add one more point on this before we go to final thoughts? I did, yeah. What I mentioned in the chat was warfare is not the word that I wanted to use at the end of my statement, but I did want to say something about um, constant um, pressure and threat. But what I actually want to say is that I think the part of what's radical and really exciting about this poem is that it's imagining a future and in the context of Black life, especially in the United States, imagining a mundane future is actually a radical praxis um, because of the reality of gratuitous violence against Black people historically in this country in the past and in, in Emmett Till's past and in E.B. Ewing's present. Thank you for that. Thank you very much for that because it was sort of what I was thinking about when I was asking what, and I didn't ask it very well, but what the speaker is going to do, what's going to be next. Um, the last line is, it goes, it goes. It's ambiguous. It's not clear where that's coming from. It's exactly what you're saying. Can we lead a life where the encounter is a, you know, a candy bar, a hello, talk about the weather, and then it goes. We go on. We do. We just go on. Um, wouldn't that be nice if we could just go on?